Welcome students, faculty, families, and other Declamation fans to the 30th Thayer Academy Declamation Celebration. Your assignment for this afternoon is simple. Listen, immerse yourself in the content, find something to inspire you in each performance. Think about what we use our hands for, what hands allow us to do, and about what hands can symbolize. Our first declaimer, Journey King, will share with us a poet's creative insight about an often used symbol of creativity. People used to tell me I had beautiful hands. Told me so often, in fact, I started to believe them, started listening, until I asked my photographer father, hey daddy, could I be a hand mommy? To which dad laughed and said, no way. I don't remember the reason he gave me, and it probably didn't matter anyway. I would have been upset, but there were far too many crayons to grab, too many stuffed animals to hold, too many ponytails to tie, too many homework assignments to write, too many boys to wave at, too many years to grow. We used to have a game, my dad and I, about holding hands. We held hands everywhere, in the car, on the bus, on the street, at a movie. And every time, either he or I would whisper a great big number to the other, pretending that we were keeping track of how many times we held hands that we were sure that this one had to be 8,002,753. Hands learn. More than minds do, hands learn how to hold other hands, how to grip pencils and mold poetry, how to memorize computer keys and telephone buttons in the night, how to tickle piano keys and grip bicycle handles, how to, they, how to dribble a basketball and memorize pages of Sunday comics that somehow always seem to stick together. They learn how to touch old people and how to hold babies. Some people read palms to tell your future. I read hands to tell your past. Each scar marks a story worth telling. Each callous palm, each cracked knuckle, a broken bottle, a missed punch, a rusty nail, years in a factory. Now, I watch Middle Eastern hands clenched in Middle Eastern fists, pounding against each other like war drums. Each country sees their fists as warriors and others as enemies, even if fists alone are only hands. But this is not a poem about politics. Hands are not about politics. This is a poem about love and fingers. Fingers interlocked like a beautiful accordion of flesh or a zipper of prayer. One time, I grabbed my dad's hand so our fingers interlocked perfectly, but he changed his position saying, no, that handle's cold as for your mom. Kids high five. Sounds of hand-to-hand -hand combat instead mark camaraderie and teamwork. Now, grown up, we learn to shake hands. You need a firm handshake, but not too tight. Don't be limp now. Don't drop too soon, but for God's sakes, don't hold on too long. But hands are not politics. When did it become so complicated? I always thought it simple. The other day, my dad grabbed my hand and looked at it as if seeing it for the first time. And with laughter behind his eyelids, with all the seriousness a man of his humor could muster, he said, you've got nice hands. You could have been a hand model. And before the laughter can escape me, I shake my head at him and squeeze his hand. 8,002,754. As hands can be symbolic, so can the heart. We know that the heart of a person is more than a vital organ that pumps blood through the body. But what is the heart of a city? Our next acclaimer, Katie McDevitt, will show us. Mayor Menino's Boston Marathon bombing address. Good morning. 
and it is a good morning because we are together. We are one Boston. No adversity, no challenge, nothing can tear down the resilience in the heart of this city and its people. It is written that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. As the clock struck that fateful hour, love has covered this resilient city. I have never loved it, its people, more than I do today. We have never loved it and its people more than we do today. We love the brave ones who felt the blast and still raced to the smoke. With ringing in their ears, they answered cries of those in need. This was the courage of our city at work. We love the fathers and the brothers who took shirts off their backs to stop the bleeding. The mothers and the sisters who cared for the injured. The neighbors and the business owners, the homeowners all across the city. They opened their doors and their hearts to the wary and the scared. They said, what's mine is yours. We'll get through this together. This was the compassion of the city at work. We never love the heroes who wear their uniforms more than we do at this hour. Boston's finest in their blue, they carried kids to safety and calmed a city in crisis. The EMTs performed miracles in an instant. The firefighters answered the call. We love the National Guard and our service members who brought valor to our streets. The volunteers in the BAA jackets and the vests. The doctors, the nurses, who waited in scrubs and did not buckle as the victims and the gravely injured arrived. This was the strength of the city at work. We never loved the people of the city, the world and our great country more for their prayers and wishes. And yes, we even love New York City more. Sweet Caroline played at Yankee Stadium and our city's flag flying in lower Manhattan. It gives us even more strength to say prayer after prayer for the victims still recovering through the hospitals at home. It gives us strength to say goodbye to the young boy with the big heart, Martin Richard. We pray for his sister and his mom, his brother and his dad. It helps us to say that we'll miss Crystal Campbell and celebrate her spirit that brought her to the marathon year after year. It prepares us to mourn Lou Lindsay, who came to the city in search of education and found new friends who will never forget her. I'm telling you, nothing can defeat the heart of the city. Nothing. Nothing will take us down because we take care of one another. Even with the smell of the smoke in the air and blood on the streets, tears in our eyes, we triumphed over that hateful act on Monday afternoon. It's a glorious thing. The love and the strength covers our city. It will push us forward. It will push thousands and thousands and thousands of people across the finish line next year. Because this is Boston, a city with courage, compassion, and strength that knows no bounds. Thank you. While dedicating a cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the site of one of the deadliest battles in our nation's history, one American president also sought to unite his country that was still at war with itself. Try to hear this sentiment as Jackson Lehner shares some of the most famous words in American history. The Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation, so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on the great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us. 
that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. In an effort to be polite, have you ever held in what you really wanted to tell a person who said something offensive? If so, you'll enjoy our next acclaimer, Jesse King. What Teachers Make by Taylor Molly. He says, the problem with teachers is, what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided his best option in life was to become a teacher? <laughs> he reminds the other dinner guests that it's true what they say about teachers. Those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. I decide to bite my tongue instead of his and resist the temptation to remind the dinner guests that it's also true what they say about lawyers. Because we're eating, after all, and this is polite conversation. I mean, you're a teacher, Taylor. Be honest, what do you make? And I wish he hadn't done that. Asked me to be honest? Because you see, I have this policy about honesty and butt kicking if you ask for it, then I have to let you have it. You want to know what I make? I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I can make a C-plus feel like a Congressional Medal of Honor and an A-minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything less than your very best? I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute silence. No, you may not work in groups. No, you may not ask a question. Why won't I let you go to the bathroom? Because you're bored and you don't really have to go to the bathroom, do you? I make parents tremble in fear when I call home. Hi, this is Mr. Malley. I hope I haven't called at a bad time. I just wanted to talk to you about something your son said today. To the biggest bully in the grade, he said, leave the kid alone. I still cry sometimes. Don't you? It's no big deal. And that was the noblest act of courage I have ever seen. I make parents see their children for who they are and what they can be. You want to know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write. I make them read, read, read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, over and over and over again until they will never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show all their work in math and hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them understand that if you've got this, then you follow this. And if someone ever tries to judge you by what you make, you give them this. Here, let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. Teachers make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? All of us feel anxiety at times, but what if we never felt relief from our anxieties? Anxiety disorders are among the most common mental disorders experienced by Americans. Caden Darrow will take us into the mind of a young girl named Audrey who suffers from an anxiety disorder. An excerpt from Finding Audrey by Sophie Kinsella. Previously, in Audrey Turner's life, except, jeez, I can't go into it all again. Sorry, I just can't. I've sat in enough rooms with teachers, doctors, regurgitating the same story, using the same words, till it starts to feel like something that happened to someone else. Everyone involved has started to feel unreal. All the girls at Stokeland Girls School, Miss Amerson, our head teacher, said I was deluded and seeking attention. Attention, Irony God, are you listening? There was a big scandal, yada yada. Three girls were excluded, which was a record. My parents took me out of Stokeland instantly, and I've been at home ever since. Well, and hospital, which I told you about already. The idea is that I start again. Only to start again, you need to be able to get out of the house, which is why I have a teeny problem. It's not the outside, per se. It's not the trees, or air, or sky. It's the people. I mean, not all people. I have my comfort people. 
people I can talk to, laugh with, feel relaxed with. It's just going to make it quite a small group. I can eat supper with my family. All the people in my therapy groups at St. John's, they're comfort people too. Because they're not a threat. Okay, okay. I know people aren't really a threat, but try telling my stupid brain that. It's everyone else who's the problem. People on the streets, people at the front door, people on the phone. You have no idea how many people are in this world till you start getting freaked out by them. The thing is, I was never exactly out there, even when I was okay. In a bunch of girls, I was the one standing alone, hiding behind her hair. I was the one trying to join and chat about bras, even though, hello, a bra? That would surely require a female shape. You still want to know, don't you? You're still curious. I mean, I don't blame you. Here's the thing. Does it matter exactly what happened and why those girls were excluded? It's irrelevant. It happened. Done. Over. I'd rather not go into it. I mean, I appreciate your interest and concern. I really do. But you don't need to pollute your brain with that stuff. Go and, like, listen to a nice song instead. How deep do you think the deepest rabbit hole is? This excerpt of English literature, which Gavin Pravarnik will share, suggests that it is much deeper than we might have thought. I'm doing an excerpt from Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Why, how impolite of him. I asked him a civil question, and he pretended not to hear me. That's not at all nice. I say, Mr. White Rabbit, where are you going? Hmm, he won't answer me. And I do so want to know what he's late for. I wonder if I might go follow him. Why not? There's no rule that I make away, please. I, I will go follow him. Wait for me, Mr. White Rabbit, I'm coming too. How curious. I never realized that rabbit holes were so dark and so long and so empty. I believe I've been falling for five minutes and I still can't see the bottom. After such a fall as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling downstairs. Why, how brave they'll think of me at home. I wouldn't even say anything about it if I fell off the top of the house. I wonder how many miles I've been falling by this time. I must be getting somewhere near the center of the earth. I wonder if I shall fall, shall fall right through the earth. Oh, how funny that will be. Oh, I think I see the bottom. Yes, I'm sure I see the bottom. I shall hit the bottom, hit it very hard, and know how it will hurt. In 1872, this famous American, who now appears on American Currency, was charged and convicted for illegally voting in a presidential election. Why was the vote illegal? Because women were not allowed to vote in 1872, and they wouldn't be allowed to vote until 1920 long after this woman's death. Anne Catherine Wickern will share with us why this famous American refused to pay the fine for her crime of voting while female. Woman's right to vote, Susan B. Anthony. Friends and fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight under indictment for the alleged crime of having voted at the last presidential election without having a lawful right to vote. It shall be my work this evening to prove to you that in this voting, I not only committed no crime, but instead simply exercised my citizens' rights, guaranteed to me and all United States citizens, beyond the power of any state to deny. The preamble of the federal constitution says, we the people of the United States, in order to form more perfect union, establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It was we the people, not we the white male citizens, nor yet we the male citizens, but we, the whole people, who formed the Union. And we formed it, not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves or the half of our posterity, but to the whole people, women as well as men. And and it is a downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of securing them, provided by this dem democratic Republican government, the ballot. For any state to make a sex qualification, 
than was ever result in a disfranchisement of one entire half of the people. It's the pass a bill of attainder, or an ex post facto law, and is therefore a violation of the supreme law of the land. By the blessings of liberty that are forever withheld from women and their freedom and posterity. To them, this government has no just powers derived from the consent of the governed. To them, this government is not a democracy. It is not a republic. It is an odious aristocracy, a, hate, the mo a hateful oligarchy of sex, the most hateful aristocracy ever established on the face of the globe, an oligarchy of wealth where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race, where the Saxon rules the African might be endured. With this oligarchy of sex, which makes father, brothers, husbands, sons, the oligarchs over the mother and sisters, the wife and daughters of every household, which ordains all men sovereigns, all women subjects, carries dissension, discord, and rebellion into every home of the nation. Webster, Worcester, Bouvier, all define a person as a citizen of the United States, entitled to vote and hold office. Now the only question left to be settled now is, are women persons? And I hardly believe any of our opponents have the hardihood to say they are not. Being persons, they are, then they are citizens. And no state has a right to make any law or to enforce any old law that shall abrive their privileges or immunities. Hence, every discrimination against women in the several laws in the, se in the several laws and constitutions of the several states is today null and void, precisely as is everyone against Negroes. In the early 1960s, a young president inspired this nation and much of the world to promote freedom for all people. Alec Borges will share excerpts from his inaugural address. This is an excerpt from President John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath that our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do, for we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. 
To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away, merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. And to remember that, in the past, those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The American Ballet Theater. America's National Ballet Company, as recognized by Congress in 2006, didn't promote an African-American dancer to a principal role until last June. Kendall Bryant will share with us this dancer's thoughts before her historic performance. An excerpt from Life in Motion by Misty Copeland. It's morning, 8 a.m. to be exact. As I stretch my arms, I realize how achy my body is. Still, it's a wonderful aching that every dancer knows. I'm eager for this day to start so that later I can rise again on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House. Tonight, I will become one of the first black women to star in Igor Stravinsky's iconic role for American Ballet Theater, one of the most prestigious dance companies in the world, as the Firebird. My barroom up this morning would be familiar to any ballet dancer, whether she's an apprentice, or a seven-year-old taking her first ballet class. I start with plies, or increasingly deeper bends of the knee. I transition to rond de jambes and fondues. I finish with port de bras, stretching my torso forward and from side to side. The challenge of dancing a full three-act ballet is like learning to accessorize for any occasion. I have to think about whether I want to add sass or longing or, as I will tonight, the exotic, otherworldly energy of the mythical firebird. You have to know the appropriate way to adorn each story and character with your body. The difference between being an amazing technician and being a soloist is mastering those interpretive flourishes to tell the best story. Otherwise, you aren't a ballerina. You're just another dancer. I know that I'll never have the perfect technique, ever. But that's why I love it so much. It's my safe place where I can experiment. I sweat, grunt, and make faces that would never pass on the Metropolitan Opera House stage. It's the time to push myself beyond my limits so that my performance can feel effortless, fresh, Beat one, on my toes. Beat two, dart to the right. Beat three, bound through the air. I feel energized. I feel ready. This is for the little brown girls. In the mirror, Misty disappears and a mythical creature takes her place. Its face dusted with blood glitter and painted with dazzling red spirals that shoot from the corners of its eye. I think to myself, this is my moment. Finally, the moment to shine, to prove myself, and to represent black dancers on every level of ballet. This is for the little brown girls. I make my way towards stage. It felt like a promise. Someday, somehow, it was going to happen for me. And a decade later, I'm here. I take a deep breath. 
the music starts, and with it comes the cheers, a great roar of love from the audience. And I realize that in that moment, it doesn't matter what I do on stage tonight. They're all here for me, here with me, here for what tonight represents. I run onto stage and feel myself transform. And so, it begins. What is the difference between a book we own and a book we have borrowed? Listen to Zach Gondelman for the answer. Enjoy some great similes and learn why we should mark literature as we read. I am doing an excerpt from William Lyon Phelps' speech, The Pleasure of Books. The habit of reading is one of the greatest resources of mankind. And we enjoy reading books that belong to us much more than if they are borrowed. A borrowed book is like a guest in the house. It must be treated with punctiliousness, with a certain considerate formality. You must see that it sustains no damage. It must not suffer while under your roof. You cannot leave it carelessly. You cannot mark it. You cannot turn down the pages. You cannot use it familiarly. And then, someday, although this is seldom done, you have really ought to have turned. But your own books belong to you, and you treat them with that affectionate intimacy that annihilates formality. Books are for use, not for show. You show no book that you're afraid to mark up, or afraid to place on the table wide open and face down. A good reason for marking favorite passages in books is that this practice enables you to remember more easily the significant sayings, refer to them quickly, and then in later years, it is like visiting a forest where you've once blazed a trail. You have a pleasure of going over the old ground and recalling both the intellectual scenery and your own earlier self. Everyone should begin collecting a private library in youth. The instinct of private property, which is fundamental in human beings, can here be cultivated with every advantage and no evils. One should have one's own bookshelves, which should not have doors, glass windows, or keys. They should be free and accessible to the hand as well as the eye. The best of mural decorations is books. They are more varied in color and appearance and have the prime advantage of being separate personalities. So that if you sit alone in the room, in the firelight, you are surrounded with intimate friends. The knowledge that they are there in plain view is both stimulating and refreshing. You do not have to read them all. Most of my own indoor life is spent in a room containing 6,000 books, and I have a stock answer to the invariable question that comes from strangers. Have you read all these books? Some of them twice. This reply is both true and unexpected. Thank you. Have you ever been made to feel isolated by someone else's cruelty? If so, did you later realize that you weren't the only one to feel that way? Our last declaimers, Bay Jr. Fallon, Olivia O'Connor, and Elena Gonzalez, will help us to see that people who are made to feel isolated aren't always alone. To This Day by Shane Coison. When I was a kid, I used to think that pork chops and karate chops were the same thing. I thought they were both pork chops. And because my grandmother thought it was cute and because they were my favorite, she let me keep doing it. Not really a big deal. One day before I realized fat kids weren't designed to climb trees, I fell out of a tree and bruised the right side of my body. I didn't want to tell my grandmother about this because I was afraid I'd get in trouble for playing somewhere I shouldn't have been. A few days later, the gym teacher noticed the bruises, and I got sent to the principal's office. From there, I was sent to another small room with a really nice lady who asked me all kinds of questions about my life at home. I saw no reason to lie. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty good. I told her, whenever I'm sad, my grandmother gives me karate chops. <laughs> this led to a full-scale investigation and I was removed from the house for three days until they finally decided to ask me how I got the bruises. 
news of this silly little story quickly spread throughout school, and I earned my first nickname, Pork Chop. To this day, I hate pork chops. I'm not the only kid who grew up this way, surrounded by people who used to say that rhyme about sticks and stones as if broken bones hurt more than the names we got called. And, and we, we got, got called, called them all. So we grew up believing no one would ever fall in love with us. That we'd be lonely forever. That we'd never meet someone to make us feel like the sun was something they built for us in their tool shed. So as broken heartstrings bled the blues, we tried to empty ourselves so we would feel nothing. Don't, Don't tell, tell me that, that hurts less, less than a broken, broken bone. bone. That an ingrown life is something surgeons can cut away, but there's no way for it to metastasize. It, it does. does. She was eight years old, her first day of grade three, when she got called ugly. We both got moved to the back of the class, so we'd stop getting bombarded by spitballs. But the school halls were a battleground where we found ourselves outnumbered. Day after wretched day, we used to stay inside for recess because outside was worse. Outside, we'd have to rehearse running away or learn to stay still like statues, giving no clues that we were there. In grade five, they taped a sign at the front of her desk that read, Beware of Dog. To this day, despite a loving husband who doesn't think she's beautiful because of a birthmark that takes up a little less than half her face, Kids used to say. She looks like a wrong answer that someone tried to erase. But couldn't quite get the job done. And they'll never understand that she is raising two kids whose definition of beauty begins with the word mom. Because they see her heart before they see her skin. And that she's only always ever been amazing. He was a broken branch grafted onto a different family tree. Adopted, but not because his parents opted for a different destiny. He was three when he became a mixed drink of one part left alone and two parts tragedy. Started therapy in eighth grade, had a personality made up of tests and pills, lived like the uphills were mountains, the downhills were cliffs, four fifths suicidal, a tidal wave of antidepressants, and an adolescence of being called popper. One part because of the pills, 99 parts because of the cruelty. He tried to kill himself in grade 10, when a kid who could still go home to mom and dad had the audacity to tell him, get over it. As if depression is something that can be remedied by any of the contents found in a first aid kit. To this day, he's a stick of TNT lit from both ends. Could describe to you in detail the way the sky bends in the moment before it's about to fall. And despite an army of friends who all call him an inspiration, he remains a conversation piece between people who can't understand. Sometimes being drug free has less to do with addiction and more to do with sanity. We're not the only kids who grew up this way. To this day, kids are still being called names. The classics were. Hey, stupid. Hey, spouse. Seems like each school has an arsenal of names getting updated every year. And if a kid breaks in a school, and no one around chooses to hear, do they make a sound? Are they just the background noise of a soundtrack stuck on repeat? When people say things like, kids can be cruel. Every school was a big top circus tent, and the pecking order went from acrobats to lion tamers, from clowns to carnies, all of these miles ahead of who we were. We, we were, were freaks. freaks. Lobster clawed boys. Bearded ladies. Oddities, juggling depression and loneliness, playing solitaire, spin the bottle, trying to kiss the wounded parts of ourselves and heal. But at night, while others slept, we kept walking the tightrope. It was practice. And yeah, some of us fell. But I want to tell them that all of this is just debris. Left over from when we finally decide to smash all the things we thought we used to be. And if you can't see anything beautiful about yourself, get a better mirror. Look a little closer. Stare a little longer. Because there's something inside you that made you keep trying, despite everyone who told you to quit. You built a caster on your broken heart and signed it yourself. You signed it. They, they were, were wrong. wrong. Because maybe you didn't belong to a group or a clique, 
Maybe they decided to choose you last for basketball or everything. Maybe they used to bring bruises and broken teeth to show and tell, but never told. Because how can you hold your ground if everyone around you wants to bury you beneath it? You, you have, have to believe, believe that, that they, they were wrong. wrong. They have to be wrong. Why else would we still be here? We grew up learning to cheer on the underdog because we see ourselves in them. We stem from a root planted in the belief that we are not what we were called. We are not abandoned cars, stalled out and sitting empty on some highway. And if in some way we are, don't worry. We only got out to walk and get gas. We are graduating members from the class of We Made It. Not the faded echoes of voices crying out, names will never hurt me. Of course they did. But our lives will only ever always continue to be a balancing act. It has less to do with pain and more to do with beauty. Many of you again this time next year at the 31st Declamations. Until then, use your hands, know your heart, be dedicated to the unfinished work others have so nobly advanced. Feel good about what you make. Don't let anxiety control you. Stay out of rabbit holes. Fight for the rights you deserve. Think about what you can do for this country. Feel the strength that comes from those who support you. Mark your literature. And remember, you're not the only one. <laughs>